this is going to be a very quick coverage of multiplexing. Just the, what is multiplexing really? Ten minutes. Uh, mainly because we mention it a little bit in later topics and on switching. So what we know so far is how to get data across links. A link between one device and another device. Usually a point-to-point -point link. Just two devices attached to that link. So we know how to efficiently get that data across a link. The problem with using a link just between two users is it can beca become inefficient. If we have a link that can support one megabit per second and there's only one source communicating to one destination, sometimes the source may have no data to send. So even though they pay for a one megabit per second link, sometimes they may use all of that, but in other periods of time they may have nothing to send or a little, little amount of information to send, and that for would be inefficient use of that link. So we've seen how to make the efficiency or how to calculate the efficiency of a link using stop and wait and sliding window and so on. But in practice, the efficiency of the usage of a link depends on how much data you have to send. If you don't have data to send at some period of time, then the link sits there idle. So we have the problem, if we don't have enough data to, to fully utilize the link, what do we do? Well, the solution is to allow multiple stations to use that one link. So we have a link, and instead of having one source and one destination, have multiple sources using that one link to get to multiple destinations. So that when one pair of source destination is transmitting, maybe the other pair have nothing to send. So when one source has nothing to send, the other can send their data. And as time changes, maybe the pair that had nothing to send now has some data to send, and hopefully the other source has nothing to send. So that with our link, just one link, we'd like 100% of the time for that link to be utilized. If people pay for that link, they want to make sure it's used all the time. So multiplexing allow data from multiple stations to share the one link. And that's, we'll talk briefly about the two different approaches to allow that. Normally used over long distance communications because a telecommunications company may have a link from here to Chiang Mai. That's not just for one user. That's for all of their customers. So the traffic from all of their customers goes across that one link. Because in some cases, their customers are sending that some customers are sending data to Chiang Mai and others are sending nothing to them. If every customer had their own link to Chiang Mai, if we had a hundred customers of that telecommunication company and everyone had their own physical link, sometimes those links would not be used because the customers would have nothing to send. By having one link and having all the data of all cust customers going across that one link, we can increase the utilization of that link. That's better for the person who owns the link. It's more, uh, it's more likely to be fully utilized. So multiplexing used in long dis distance communications commonly, between cities, across cities, between countries, when we have multiple users that need to get data between a source and destination. Another term you'll see is multiple access, similar concepts, but is in fact referring to when two or more than two users share a medium. When we're talking about links, we're often talking about point-to-point -point links, but we can't have point-to-multipoint, like our class. We have one transmitter, multiple receivers, really over one link, one wireless link. So when you have mo more than two users sharing a medium, we have things called, or we have multiple access techniques. Very similar to multiplexing techniques, but not quite the same. We're looking just at multi multiplexing. If you read a textbook, it talks about multiple access as well. 
you may have know with mobile, some mobile phone systems use CDMA, Code Division Multiple Access. With multiplexing, it allows us to carry a large, morning. good morning, we can have a link with a large capacity and allow data from multiple users to be carried at the same time. Our link from Bangkok to Chiang Mai, a telecommunications company may have a one gigabit per second link and that can support the data of hundreds of customers at the same time. And that can be more efficient, more cost effective for the telecommunication company. We can visualize a multiplex link like this where we have the one link between a source and a destination, this source device is a multiplexer, a MUC. It takes the data, the data from multiple inputs, combines that data together and transmit it as one signal across this link. And the DMUX, the demultiplexer, takes the received signal and separates it out to the individual destinations. So if user one was sending a signal into the top link and user two into the second link and so on, the multiplexer would combine those signals and generate one output signal. Send across this one link, demultiplexer would split those signals up and direct the components to the intended destination. Yes, it, if, if we have 10 users and they're all transmitting data as their signal, whether analog or digital, they're sending signals on the input line, this somehow combines it and transmits one signal that represents all of those inputs. Not, not like a we studied it before. We'll see, it can be like that. We'll see the two main approaches of how to combine them in the next few slides. Yeah, that is, how do we combine all of these input signals to get one output signal? Well, there are two basic ways. <coughs> so we have one link and multiple inputs connect to multiple outputs. And although we're sending one, one signal across this link, we can talk about it having different channels each channel representing the data from each of the input users. So if we have, I don't know, eight input users, although we send one signal, we can break that into eight different channels. And you'll see a, an example that, is very, or that you understand in the next few slides. Why do we do this? We can have a higher data rate link and can be more cost effective for the link, that is, a telecommunications company buy, pays for a link and because in some cases not all users are utilizing the link that they need, then it can be more cost effective because the utilization of this one link can approach 100%. We'd like to, if we pay a thousand baht per month for a link, we'd like to use the full capacity every month. Because if we don't, we might as well pay less money. So it can be more cost effective to have a link where we use multiplexing, as opposed to if we didn't use multiplexing, we would use 10 different links between the, all these sources to all these destinations. 10 different cables. That would be less cost effective because sometimes we may not utilize all of those 10 cables. How do we multiplex? That is, how do we combine the input signals into one output signal? Two different approaches. Divide by frequency and divide by time. That is, we have one link that we're sending data from multiple users across. We're sending a signal across that one link to represent the data from multiple users. In frequency division multiplexing, we have multiple users tr effectively transmitting across that one link all at the same time 
but transmitting their signals or transmitting their data as signals at different frequencies. That is, we have a link, I transmit at frequency one, I transmit my data at frequency one, the next person transmits their data at a different frequency. Different frequencies such that they don't interfere with each other and the receiver, the demultiplexer, will receive one signal which has different frequency components and it will take everything received on frequency one and send it to the first user, everything received on frequency two and send to the second user and so on. So frequency division multiplexing, the, multiple, the signals from the multiple users are combined together, transmitted at the same time but at different frequencies. We divide, we have division by frequencies, frequency division multiplexing. So, as an example, let's say we have an input analog signal from each user, which is five megahertz. So, User one is transmitting an input signal that requires a bandwidth of five megahertz. And we have six users, user two down to user six, all tr wanting to transmit data that uses an analog signal occupying five megahertz bandwidth. So our multiplexer takes the input signals, so some signal at, with a bandwidth of five megahertz. Doesn't matter about the frequency, they may be the same frequencies, maybe the frequency is centered on, let's say 100 megahertz. So a bandwidth of five megahertz means that the signal contains components from 97.5 megahertz up to 102.5 megahertz. If I draw that in the frequency domain, if we range from 97.5 up to 102.5, 102, FC is the carrier or the center frequency. megahertz, 97, the minimum frequency component is 97.5 megahertz, the maximum is 102.5, gives us a bandwidth of 5 megahertz. That's what I mean with the input signal. It has a center frequency of 100 and a bandwidth of 5 megahertz. That's what the data being transmitted by user 1 is. And the same with user 2, they may be transmitting on the same frequency and the same bandwidth, and each of the six users. The data comes in to the multiplexer. The multiplexer needs to combine that and send that out on one output link. So what it does is it combines them and shifts the frequency, in particular the center frequency of all the input signals, such that they don't interfere. Let's see if we can draw it. <coughs> run out of space. I'll draw four, there'll be another two. The bandwidth of each of these are five mega, megahertz. <coughs> and although I've drawn only four, you can draw another two. Each of five megahertz bandwidth. But the center frequencies are different. Frequency one, frequency two, frequency three. For example, let's give this uh, 200 megahertz. 
which would, if the center was 200 megahertz, it would range from 197.5 up to 202.5. We may have some spacing, so we make sure that there's no interference. And then maybe let's set this one at 210 megahertz. So in fact, this signal has components ranging from 207.5 up to 212.5 with a bandwidth of 5 megahertz, and so on for the next components, just as an example. This would be the signal transmitted by the multiplexer. In, in this example, just to give them a different numbers, I've changed the frequency. We don't have to. Uh -huh. The point is that each component signal from each of the users have different frequencies and usually separated such that they do not overlap. And the distance should be... The dis distance should be large enough to give it some... Uh, to make sure that they will not overlap. Uh, five five no, the, the distance, although I've used a, a distance of five here, that, that's not... I have a gap. The size of that gap is... I'm not saying what it will be. Normally, it depends on what is the bandwidth of your signal. When we say a bandwidth of a signal is 5 megahertz, in practice, it may not exactly be 5 megahertz. It may, in fact, leak out a little bit to the side in practice. So that's why when we transmit the individual components, we separate them just in case there is some signal portion of the or some signal components that are in this frequency range, we separate them so that what's transmitted here doesn't interfere with what's transmitted here. If two people transmit on the same frequency, those signals will interfere with each other and the receiver will not be able to understand what was transmitted. Here we're transmitting six signals on different frequencies all at the same time across the one link. And that's what our FDM, or Frequency Division Multiplexer, is doing. I've drawn four, there should be six. Um, the receiver, the demultiplexer, receives a signal that looks like this. And it simply takes, the, it filters out the different frequency components. It takes the signals received in this range and forwards them on to the link that goes to user one. And in the second range, it forwards them on to the second link and so on. So what's happening, user one is transmitting, as are the other five users. Their signals are combined together and eventually the signal from user one is, comes out on this link and from user 2, and user 3, and user 5, and user 6. So if this is the source for user 1, or customer 1 of a telecommunication company, this is the destination for that same user or customer. The data is going from here to here, and the data from user 6 is going from here to here. But in fact, the data from all six users is going across that one link at the same time. That's frequency division multiplexing. The bandwidth of the signal sent across that link should be at least enough to carry the bandwidth of all the user's signals. The minimum bandwidth across this link should be what? The minimum bandwidth across this link. Minimum. 30. Si if we want to support six users, each user requires a bandwidth of 5 megahertz, then this link should have a minimum bandwidth of 30 megahertz. If we want to incorporate some spacing, then it needs to be more than 30. Depends on how much spacing we want there. The same can be applied if we look at data rates. Instead of looking at analog signals, 
let's say this is a, a digital transmission and it's sending at five megabits per second. And this one's five megabits per second and five megabits per second. Then we could combine them, and we'll see in the next slide, we can combine them and this link would be able to, would need to support at 30 megabits per second carrying the data of all those users at the same time. And that approach is time division multiplexing, or we can implement that using time division multiplexing. In TDM, the users transmit on the same frequency, but take in turns in time. User one transmits a part of their data, and then user two, and then user three, and then user six, and then user one transmits again. Yeah, take in turns, a round robin system where user one through to user six, then user one, so we take we give different time slots for each user. If user one was sending at five megabits, or one megabit per second, at one megabit per second, then in, what have they got? One bit every microsecond. So every microsecond, this one is transmitting one bit. Let's give some numbers. one microsecond per bit, each of the user uh, is transmitting. So what we could do, a very simple approach, is to take one bit from the first user, which occupies one microsecond, a bit from the second user, the third user, and the sixth user, and then from the first user again. That is, every on this link, every microsecond, we need to transmit one bit from user one, and then one bit from user two, and one bit from user six. Because every microsecond we need to transmit one bit to get one megabit per second. So what we do in one microsecond on this link, transmit one bit from each user, or six bits in one microsecond. Six bits in one microsecond, we transmit at six megabits per second. So the, the minimum data rate required to support the traffic from all users on this link is six megabits per second. That makes sense. If this one wants to send at one megabit per second, each of them want to, s each of the six users want to send at one megabit per second, and we want to support all of that traffic across this link, this link needs a capacity of at least six megabits per second. And the way that we divide that up is that we allow data from each user to be transmitted one after the other, divide by time. Most, the most common applications of them are, yes, uh, TDM for digital transmission and frequency division multiplex when you're looking at the analog transmission. And the demultiplexer in this case simply takes, it's receiving six million bits per second. It takes the first bit received, sends it to user one, the second bit sends to user two, the sixth bit to user six, and then the next bit goes to user one and so on. So as a result, they're receiving at one megabit per second. There are different ways to do time division multiplexing, but that's all we want to cover for now. And that's about it with multiplexing. We allow multiple users to transmit at the same time across the one link either by dividing that link by frequency or by time.
some example technologies that use FDM and TDM. Broadcast TV, cable TV uses frequency division multiplexing. TV station is transmitting multiple TV channels at once and your TV receiver receives them, you just tune into one of those channels. It's transmitting both cable and, and normal microwave TV do the same thing. They're transmitting multiple channels using different frequencies. Same with radio, you, choose it, you tune into a particular channel. But the, in most cases, they're transmitting multiple cha channels at the same time, just at different frequencies. Optical fiber, sorry, too far. Optical fiber uses frequency division multiplexing. With optical fiber, we have a glass or plastic fiber. We send light across it. We can send light waves, light rays at different frequencies across that same fiber, and they can carry different sets of data. And by using, we use different frequencies, but it's usually referred to as using different wavelengths, the inverse of, or the inversely proportional to the frequency. And you get wavelength division multiplexing. ADSL, your home internet connection, uses FDM. Many digital telecommunication networks uses, use TDM. Uh, you may have heard or I may have mentioned in other examples things like PDH, SDH and Sonnet. They are technologies that use TDM for links usually between cities, across cities and between countries. Just some examples. And some of those examples and the technical details are listed there. You can, if you don't want to use an ADSL link from SIT between our two campuses, we could go to one of the telecommunication companies and lease one of these uh, TDM links between our campuses and lease a link at, say, a data rate of 2 megabit per second or 8 megabits per second. And these technologies, T1, T2 and so on, use time division multiplexing. The links between cities and between countries usually use time division multiplexing. Even using optical fiber, you'll hear of things like Sonnet and SDH. They have two and a half gigabit per second links, nine or ten gigabit per second links between countries. The link between Thailand and Singapore, for example, may be using uh, a single link using time division multiplexing to car carry data from multiple users. Maybe. No, no, no. <laughs> this is just some examples of different technologies. No. And that's it, multiplexing. The basic concept. Next topic. Some of the topics from now on will just talk about the concepts. There's no examples that we need to go through there. You really just need to know what is multiplexing. What's the difference between TDM and FDM? So that's about links. <coughs> Multiplexing is, all, is still about links, how to get data across links, but allow multiple users to share the links. The next topics, from now on, we're going to deal with networks. A link allows us to share, say, from one computer direct to another one if we have a physical attachment or maybe a, a wireless link. But often, to be able to communicate with anyone, we need multiple links, and we get a network. So we're going to talk about, in this topic, 
how do we connect and forward data across multiple, path, uh, multiple links across a network? And in the next topic, how do we choose the path to forward? First, switching. Circuit and packet switching. We'll introduce what is a switched communication network, what is a network in simple terms, and look at two approaches for getting data across a network, circuit switching and packet switching, and compare them. So we need networks to be able to interconnect many devices. Links cannot allow any person to communicate with any other person. If I was going to have a link to all the other people in the world, then I'd need many links. I'd need one link from my computer to everyone else's computer. It's just not feasible. Even inside SIT, if I wanted to link my office computer to every other office computer without using a network, I would need one cable for every other office computer. And so would everyone else. We'd need thousands of cables coming from my computer going to other computers. With a network, we can allow just one cable from my computer to attach to a network and still allow me to communicate with other users. So we use networks to interconnect devices across multiple links. And the basic way that we will deliver data across a network from one source to a destination will send via intermediate devices that connect via multiple links. So I will send to one computer, that computer will send to the next computer across a link, and then finally to the destination computer. So we may have multiple links. Those intermediate computers or computing devices will refer to as switching nodes. And the process that they follow to deliver the data from source to destination is switching. So data is transmitted from a source node to a destination node through a network of switching nodes. This diagram shows it. We have our source station We'll refer to the sources and destinations, the computers that the users are using as stations. And they attach to a network, a communications network. This cloud represents our network. And the network is made up of these intermediate devices, switching nodes. Their role is to get the data from a source to some destination. So in this case, we have seven switching nodes, six stations, and in this network, we can allow any station to be a source and communicate with any other station by sending their data via the switching node. So if station B wants to communicate with station F, it can send data to, station, uh, to switching node one across this link, and switching node one can then swi send a switching node two across this, this link, and eventually we can follow a path to get to the destination F. So in this network, there are two things that are important. How to deliver data from source to destination via switching nodes, and that's what this topic's about. The next thing is how to choose a path from source to destination. And that's what the next topic is about. Shortest, you know Dijkstra's shortest path. Routing is the next topic which we'll look at. But you'll find that easy because you know the details. But first, how to forward the data, <coughs> switching. So we have switching nodes. We have stations, the end user stations normally we think of. The stations attached to the communications network, normally the links that the stations attach to the network with are dedicated links, dedicated to this user, this station. So one cable going into one, one of the switching nodes 
and the data coming across this link is only to and from this user. Inside the network, the links between switching nodes may, may use multiplexing. <coughs> so this is where multiplexing may, you know, often comes in. Nodes are station links, often dedicated point-to-point -point links. Node-to-node -node links, often multiplex. Because the data going, say, from node 4 to node 7, this link here, may be coming from multiple sources. It may be data coming from this node, and it may be data that's coming from this node, which may have come from C or B, perhaps. So multiplexing may be used across this link to carry data from multiple sources between 4 and 7, and similar across other links. This network may be across a campus, across a city, across a country, even across the globe, for example. <laughs> there, there are <laughs> networks in space, yes, between satellites and so on. So we have switching nodes, stations, stations with dedicated links to switching nodes, multiplexing often used between the switching nodes. The connectivity between the switching nodes is normally not a mesh, full mesh network. That is normally each switching node does not connect to every other switching node. As is in this, exa this example. Node 1 only connects to 2 and 4. Node 1 does not connect directly to 5, 7, 6 or 3. Because that would require too many links if every switching node was to have a link to every other one, that may be good for efficiency of data transfer, but very inefficient in usage of links. That is, we need many links. It may not be possible. This may be in Thailand, this may be in Singapore, we may have a link direct. This may be in Australia, where there's a link from Singapore to Australia, but we don't necessarily need direct between the two countries. In most switched networks, we will not have a complete connectivity between those nodes. But we will often try to have multiple possible paths between a pair of nodes, a pair of stations. That is, to get from B to F, in this example, one path is via 1, 2, 3, 5, and 6. An alternate path is 1, 4, 7, and 6. That's a desirable attribute of a switching network, to have multiple possible paths. Because if the Singapore node fails, we can still deliver data via a longer path via, I don't know, Hong Kong and Philippines or somewhere. So by, using, by having multiple paths available, we can have redundancy. If something fails, we can send across another path. Or if this path is congested, a lot of people are sending their data across this path, then in some cases the, we have congestion and we have increased delay, so it makes sense to use a, le a less congested path and lead to better performance. What have we missed? I think we've said all of this. The two main technologies for getting data across that switch network are referred to as circuit switching and packet switching. So we'll go through how that works. Of course, this is a very simple network. In a large network, you may have hundreds of switching nodes, thousands, tens of thousands of stations attached. Let's go through circuit switching. Circuit switching. Here's a circuit switch, one of those switching nodes. The telephone is the where circuit switching was developed and is the best example, telephone network. 
in the old, old style telephone networks, what you would do is you pick up your phone. Your phone has a link to a telephone exchange, which is a switching node. So you have a cable to the telephone exchange, as do other users. You pick up your phone, you're directly connected to the telephone exchange, the switching node. The operator, you tell the operator, I want to talk to John. The operator knows that, okay, your line comes into one of these ports, and they know that John's line comes into one of these other ports. They connect your line to John's line via one of these cables, these PAT cables. So that's a switching node in an old-style telephone network. The switch connects two lines together, two links together. In today's telephone networks, the switches are digital. It is the same concept, but they're computing devices that connect. If we have links coming into a switching device, then the switch will connect those links together, but in a digital manner here, using digital circuits. And th these are examples of PABX telephone exchange boxes. They have multiple lines coming into them, and they are programmed when someone makes a call to connect one line to another. So telephone networks is where circuit switching was developed. What we do in circuit switching is we have a source node, want to connect to a destination node via different switching nodes. With circuit switching, we create a dedicated physical path from source all the way to destination via those switching nodes. We create a circuit, a physical circuit, where once that circuit's created, we can send a signal from the source and it will propagate all the way through the switching nodes to the destination. As if we uh, have a link from the source all the way to the destination. That's what we do with circuit switching. For that to work, we need to go through some connection setup or circuit setup phase. <coughs> Here's an example, although it's not, I haven't drawn other nodes in a network, we're going to, there may be other nodes here and other stations, but here's a station we want to create a connection or a circuit from a source station to a destination station via some switching nodes, the circles of the switching nodes. And it just so happened I've chosen the path to go through switching node one, two and three. There may be others, but we're not going to draw them for clarity. So what we do, so we have links, there are physical links from the source to node 1 and from node 1 to node 2. In circuit switching, we must establish a circuit, a connection or a circuit, a connection from the source to the destination. Before we can transfer data from the source to destination, we establish a circuit. So we create well, actually what we do is we, if the source wants to communicate with the destination as a phone call, you want to talk to the destination or you want to transfer data, then you send a special message saying I want to connect to destination B. Let's call it a connect request. The source wants to connect to D, sends to the switching node that it's attached to. The source may be usually attached to just one switching node. And that switching node receives the request, checks whether it will allow that request, and 
checks whether it has enough resources to support this request, which normally means that associated with the request is some indicator of how much resource is needed for this data transfer, for this connection. If everything's okay, we'll send the request onto the next node in the path. <coughs> of course, node one needs to know that the next node is node two. There may be other options. Node five, that is. That is, node one knows that the source wants to connect to node D. It needs to know the next node I'm going to send this request to is node two. How does it do that? That's routing, and that's the next topic. Knowing the path to take is necessary, but we'll assume that magically it knows to reach node D, next node is node two. Send the connect request to node two. Node two checks, do I have enough resources to accept this connection? If so, and I'm happy to accept it, send the request to node, th node three, and so on. And eventually node three will send the connect request to node D. If D wants to accept this connection, then it will respond with some acknowledgement or some accept message. The format or the structure of these requests are not important. The point is that we send a request to set up a connection or a circuit. And if that's accepted, we get some acknowledgement back saying that connection has been set up. Now, all of these nodes along the path have allocated resources for source S to transfer data to destination D. And now, source S can start sending the data to D. And when we say that we allocate resources and set up a circuit, you can think of that is that node, node one has links to multiple other nodes. It links the link from source to one to the link from one to two. And similar, two inside the switch connects the link here to this link and so on. These blue lines are like our telephone operators. They connect the incoming link to the out output link. As a result, when the source has data to send, it transmits its data. Think of it as an analog or digital signal. It sends some signal across this link. It comes into the switching node. That signal passes through the switching node out to the appropriate output link and passes through to the next link, and the signal is eventually received the same format as it was transmitted at the destination. It, 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 become one line. it becomes one link, one line. Now, block out one, two, and three. There's just one link from source to destination. So everything's the same as now having just a single link. Of course, it's a longer distance but a single link from source to destination. And we can transfer data across that link as if the intermediate nodes are not there. And that's why we talk about, talk about setting up a circuit. It's a circuit where we have, if we don't have these blue links, then we have an open circuit. There's no connection from source to destination. Once we establish the connection or circuit, we have a direct path from source all the way to destination. Of course, these links, so it's more complex in that these links may be using multiplexing. So the link may be actually carrying signals or data from multiple users, but from the perspective of this connection, if we send a signal at, with a bandwidth of five megahertz, here, it will pass all the way through and be received as a signal with five megahertz bandwidth. Or if we send at one megabit per second here, it will be delivered to the destination at one megabit per second. 
and delivered with effectively no delay at the switching node. And that's important when we compare to the next approach. Once we've set up the connection, the data goes through those switching nodes. Well, the signal passes through them. They don't process the signal. They just take the incoming signal and send it to the correct output link. Effectively, zero delay in, involved there. That's the data transfer phase. Analog or digital data is transmitted, transmitted across our circuit or connection. And when we're finished transferring the data, we may disconnect the circuit. We could send a special message from source to destination telling the intermediate devices, you no longer need to connect us together. That's important because while the connection is set up, there are resources allocated for that connection and that connection only. No one else can use those resources. The resource may be link capacity. If this link, if we're using multiplexing, had a capacity of 10 megabits per second, and we wanted to set up a connection requiring one megabit per second from source to destination, this link's using multiplexing, meaning it can carry data from multiple users. We want a one megabit per second link from source to destination. When we establish the connection, send the connect request, get the response, then of this link, we've got a capacity of 10. One megabit per second is allocated from the connection from S to B. No one else can use that. So in terms of multiplexing, if we're using TDM, one of the channels is allocated from the connection from source to destination. So there's only nine megabit per second remaining. Maybe someone else sets up a connection. There's eight megabits per second remaining. If multiple users are using this link, eventually it will be fully utilized. At that point, if say there are 10 connections passing through this link, all using one megabit per second, if someone else tries to set up a connection, they would send their connect request, this one would reject it. It doesn't have enough resource to allocate for another new connection. It will be blocked or rejected. Same as when you set, and the, the example is a telephone call. These switches are telephone exchanges. You pick up your phone, you dial in your destination's number, as a result, your phone sends a special message across the telephone network. It sends to your local telephone exchange because your home phone has a cable going from your home to some local telephone exchange, some building somewhere nearby. That is the switching node. It checks whether it's got enough resources to connect on to the next node. If so, it forwards the request to the next telephone exchange and eventually to the telephone exchange located near the destination, the person you're calling. That request gets to that destination telephone. The phone rings at the destination. When the user picks up the phone, the response comes back saying that they've accepted that connection and then you can start talking, in fact in both directions. So the process of making a phone call is dialing in the number, triggers the sending of a special signal across the network, allocating resources for that phone call in the different telephone exchanges, in the switching node. If this telephone exchange, which may be the Bangkok telephone exchange can support 10,000 calls at the same time. It has some capacity of that telephone exchange. It can support 10,000 phone calls, let's say across this link at the same time. When 10,000 people are, are talking on the phone and the next person makes a phone call, another person makes a phone call use it via this exchange, it'll be rejected. They will not be able to connect to the destination. 
they'll get a, a tone on their phone saying the network is busy. So circuit switching is used in telephone or developed for telephone networks, but can also be used for data networks. The allocation of resources that I talk about. Uh, mobile phones are attached to normal telephone networks. In, in the uh, yes, so in mobile phone networks they use circuit switching, but some 3G networks also use packet switching now. So yes, so uh, in in a mobile phone network if you get it network busy, but it, it can be due to the switch being busy, that is a switch or a line to that switch has some capacity, it can support a certain number of phone calls at once, and if all those phone calls are taking place and someone else tries to make a phone call, it will reject that connection, indicate network busy. Network busy may be different maybe due to different reasons in a mobile phone network as well. So we create a physical link from source to destination. And once we've created that link, we can transfer data from source to destination. A path or a connection is established from source to destination, what else do we say? Enough capacity must be reserved or is reserved for that connection. So when we set up the connection, the resources along that path are allocated just for that connection. No one else can use it. So if we come back to the data here, if this link had a capacity of 10 megabits per second, and we allow this connection to be set up utilizing one megabit per second, even if the source, let's say it has a connection for five minutes, for four, first four minutes it's transmitting at one megabit per second, and the last minute it's only sending at 500 kilobits per second. It slows down. Even though it's sending only at 500 kilobits per second, this one megabit per second is allocated for that connection. No one else can use that one megabit per second. So we had a capacity of 10, we allocate one for this connection, even if we're not sending at one megabit per second, in fact, even if we're sending nothing, no one else can use that resource which is allocated for that connection. So that can be wasteful. Uh, an example, <coughs> make some space, just focus on this one link, currently we have a capacity of 10, to keep things simple, let's say all connections use or request one megabit per second, the connection from S to D has been set up and using one megabit per second and there are other connections setting up from other nodes which are not shown via this link. Let's say from A to B. And once we have 10 connections across this link, that link is fully utilized. If this is the first, the second, the third, the tenth, if the next pair of nodes want to set up a connection across this link, that connection will be rejected. Okay, because all of the 10 megabit per second is allocated to 10 different connections. Now, even if these nodes are not using what's allocated, it will be rejected. That is, we allocate one megabit per second from S to D, but perhaps the source is only sending at 200 kilobits per second. It was sending at one, but then it slows down. It's just an application. It may change over time how fast it sends. 
So in fact, it's only really using 20% of what's allocated. And maybe this one is only using 200 kilobits per second. And the others are using their full one megabit per second. So the total in use across this link, if we have eight using one megabit per second, and these two are only using 200 kilobits per second, the total is, what, 8.4 megabits per second. At that point in time, the capacity is 10, but the current usage is 8.4. If the 11th connection is tried to be set up by a pair of nodes, it will be rejected. Even though the capacity is not fully utilized, we're only using 8.4 out of 10, even though these are not using everything that they've asked for, if someone else, the 11th connection, tries to set up, it will be rejected because this capacity is guaranteed for this connection. Even if they're not using it, no one else can take it away from them. That's good for these nodes. They're guaranteed one megabit per second. It's bad for the 11th connection because in this case, they could have set up a one megabit per second connection. If it did, it would have taken the usage up to 9.4, which is within the capacity. So this 11th connection would be blocked. So that can be inefficient if we reserve connections, reserve resources, but the nodes do not fully utilize those resources. Then we waste resources. It's good for the individual nodes that set up a connection, but bad for nodes that want to use resources which are currently available. <coughs> it's wasteful, but it's good in that maybe for one minute they're only sending at 200 kilobits per second, but at the other time they increase the sending rate up to one megabit per second. If, if we allowed that 11th one to use it, so if we did allow 11 in there, and then suddenly these want to increase their sending rate, then in fact we have the 10 divided by 11 users. Therefore, if we share that evenly, each user will only get about 900 kilobits per second. They'll not get their full one megabit per second. So, circuit switching is wasteful if the stations do not fully, fully utilize what they request. And that happens if the stations have a sending rate that varies over time. Maybe they want to send at one megabit per second most of the time, but sometimes they don't have to send fast. And in that case, we waste the resources. But it's good in that these are guaranteed to always get one megabit per second. So if you had a connection from your computer to the YouTube web server, which was a circuit switch connection, you may be guaranteed to be able to download from the YouTube server at one megabit per second you'll be guaranteed that the video that you view will always be clearly displayed because it will be streamed at one megabit per second, no problem. But we don't use circuit switching in the internet and therefore we get problems in that sometimes you'll get one megabit per second, sometimes it will drop down to 100 kilobits per second. So there's the trade-off that has to be dealt with. No, uh, just in this example, I've used one megabit per second. That is, in general, we could say when you connect, when you send a connect request, you indicate how much you want. But in circuit switching, if you look at a telephone network, when you create a connection to the destination, we're not talking about megabits per second, we're talking about a channel, a, a four megabit, megahertz, a four kilohertz channel. Yeah. So it's fixed in the case of telephone networks. Yeah? 
the advantage is that the users, once they've set up the connection, are guaranteed that resource. If it's data rate, they're guaranteed if they, they can send at one megabit per second. If it's a phone call, they're guaranteed that they can send their analog signal at four kilohertz bandwidth from source to destination during that connection. And therefore the performance is fixed. It doesn't depend upon other users in using the network. Also, we, once we set up the connection, the circuit switches uh, effectively disappear. That is our signal, we think about the signal being sent from source to destination. The signal passes through the switches. The delay through those switches is simply the propagation delay. Very, very small. It's just a matter of a uh, digital circuit. So the delay is zero almost through those switches. So now, what's the delay for our signal from source to destination? Simply the transmission delay depends on the size of the data, and the propagation delay, which simply depends upon the distance, which is the sum of the propagation of the link. The, effectively, the processing delay at these switches is zero, when we compare to the next approaches, at least. Yeah. In the next approaches, we'll see the processing delay is, can be significant. Here, it's insignificant. So circuit switching developed for telephone networks and carrying voice traffic. So public telephone networks use circuit switches. Private telephone networks often use circuit switching. Some will use packet switching now. Private means the connections between the phones within SIT. We don't pay for any, anything. We have a, a circuit switch in some room somewhere all the phones connect into that and connect to the run kit cancel. And private data networks, some use circuit switching. The best example maybe is banks. A bank has offices throughout the country, um, has all right, the headquarters, offices, uh, ATMs distributed around the country. They all need to connect together and exchange data. On a regular basis, the ATM needs to send data of all the transactions to some office. In the past, banks would connect all their offices and uh, ATMs via a private circuit switch network. Their, their own cables between the devices, possibly using multiplexing and using circuit switching. So automatic, telemachine. Well, automatic telemachine, the money, not money not device. Not not, not, not about uh, network, ATM money <laughs> device. But the problem with circuit switching, as we've seen, if the data that's being sent by the nodes or the stations varies over time, then it can be inefficient. And in many internet applications, the data that you send varies significantly over time. When you've got your iPad and you're browsing a website, for some period of time you're sending and receiving a lot of data, and then you're browsing and you're not sending or receiving anything for several minutes. So the sending rate goes maybe peaks. You need to be able to send data fast for a short period of time, and then you have nothing to send. And then after, so it varies a lot over time with most internet applications. And that's where circuit switching can be wasteful because we don't have a fixed sending rate. With a voice call, we normally have a fixed amount of data we want to communicate. That is, when you're talking to someone on the phone, the amount or the, the bandwidth you require is about constant. So suited to voice traffic especially can handle data traffic, but an alternative has been developed that can be more efficient for data traffic. These diagrams or these slides simply show 
uh, more examples for telephone networks. Maybe the example, a telephone network, you've got the source making a call and you have telephone exchanges. Local exchange that you may be connected to, maybe several kilometers from your home, called an end office here, and then exchanges that cover a larger region, maybe a telephone exchange that covers Bangkok and maybe a, a, an exchange in Chiang Mai and then a local one in, in some part of Chiang Mai and the destination, maybe calling someone at a university there. You create a connection via those exchanges where the exchange connects your line to the output line via some digital switch. This line may be using multiplexing. So the link between the local exchange and a, a larger telephone exchange would norm normally be large enough to carry multiple calls at the same time. And that would be have some capacity. Maybe the link here can support 1,000 telephone calls at the same time. If 1,000 people are making a call going via this link and the 1,000 of first makes a call, they would be blocked. That's where the resources are allocated. So the issues that arise, efficiency we've spoken about, resources are reserved for the duration of the connection. That's good for the source and destination because they guarantee that performance. It's bad if the sending rate goes up and down and we then are inefficient. We don't use those resources. It's good in terms of quality because, as we say, the data rate is guaranteed and the delay is guaranteed. What's the delay? Delay is simply depends on the transmission and propagation, and that's fixed. It doesn't go up and down. We'll see in the next approaches the delay can go up and down. And for voice and video traffic, delay, varying delay can be quite bad for performance. Perhaps a limitation is that the end devices must use the same transmission technology think about the same speed. The source and destination must use one megabit per second link. Or your telephone must transmit and receive the same bandwidth signal. That's okay for telephones, they use the same technology. But for computer devices, with a circuit switched in connection, the end devices need to use the same transmission speed. That's not very convenient in, in a in in the internet and computer networks. So, circuit switching has been around as long as telephone networks, which is about 100 years. Maybe 40 years ago, packet switching was developed as an alternative and turned out to be better for certain applications, especially for internet type applications. And that's what's used in the internet today. We'll go through packet switching after lunch. So let's stop there. After lunch, we'll go through packet switching and then we'll compare to circuit switching. After lunch.